Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Georgia Bach, and I'll be kicking things off uh, today with our discussion on equity in career and technical education, or CTE. Um, could we click to the next slide, please? And the agenda. Wonderful. So today we will be providing a brief overview of the CTE research landscape. Um, then we'll hear about the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium's work with schools and CTE centers. And finally, we'll move on to a panel discussion and facilitated Q&A um, about on-the-ground perspectives for addressing inequities in CTE programs. Next. Um, and so just to recap a couple of our high level goals, um, we will be sharing a high level overview of current research on equity gaps um, in access um, and participation um, and outcomes for students in CTE programs. And we'll be sharing on the ground perspectives um, on strategies to increase access and participation. Next. So before we jump in, um, I'd like to share just a brief overview about the REL program and introduce our presenters. The REL Northeastern Islands is one of 10 regional education laboratories funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. We partner with educators and policymakers in our region to use research and data to improve outcomes for students. And we also collaborate with other federally funded centers like the Equity Assistance Centers on this work. Specifically within our region, we are partnering with educators in Vermont to strengthen flexible pathways like CTE and work-based learning. In collaboration with our Vermont partners, we are currently conducting an inventory of work-based learning data to, in order to better understand um, student access, participation, and, and success in those opportunities. Next slide. So today I am joined by my REL colleague, Catherine Shields, who conducts research on college and career readiness and also co-leads our partnership in Vermont, um, as well as Jenny Portillo Nakao uh, with the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, Dr. Kathleen Plasnarski with the Equity, or excuse me, Eastern Center for the Arts in Pennsylvania, and Laurie Ferguson with the Regional Career and Technical Center at Coventry High School in Rhode Island. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about the current research landscape. Um, there has been a ton of research on CTE with many recent studies digging deeper into who has access to and who participates in CTE programs. Um, so why focus on equity in CTE? Uh, so career and technical education has its roots in vocational uh, programs. Um, which rose to popularity in the early 20th century. Um, these early vocational ed programs often track students from low income backgrounds and historically marginalized groups into industries that did not require post-secondary degrees and were often typically lower paying. Um, so while the purpose of today's CTE programs have shifted in focus, um, inequities still persist uh, when it comes to who participates in certain pathways and certain types of programs. Recent studies have shown that CTE has a positive impact on a number of outcomes, such as high school graduation, uh, post-secondary attainments, and other workforce outcomes. So fortunately, there has been an increased focus on, as well as an influx of federal funding to expand career connected learning opportunities and address barriers to participation in these types of programs. Next. So what equity gaps exist um, according to the research? Several studies have examined differences in CTE program participation by a variety of student characteristics. One multi-state study found differences by gender, race, disability status, and family income level. These results were largely driven by geography, uh, but gender did stand out as um, one factor where there were notable differences that spanned geographic locations. Across states, male students were overrepresented in manufacturing, architecture and construction, and STEM pathways, while education and training, health science, and human services were disproportionately female. Another study on CTE programs in Massachusetts found 
that within STEM programs, female, Black, and Latinx students have higher participation in health-related programs, but are underrepresented in IT and manufacturing, engineering, and technology programs. However, the same study did find that students with disabilities participate in STEM CTE programs at rates comparable to their peers with similar test scores. And another study found differences in which students were concentrators in CTE. That is to say, um, concentrators are, are students who take two or more uh, courses in the same area. And that study found that concentrators more, were more likely to be male and white. There are also inequities in access to uh, high quality opportunities. For example, one report showed communities with higher concentrations of wealth have greater access to equipment and experienced instructors. Further to that point, other reports have highlighted that rural communities often struggle to provide opportunities of similar quality um, and local uh, work-based learning opportunities that are relevant to students compared to um, you know, more rural, uh, urban or suburban uh, locales. There's also some evidence of inequities in student outcomes like post-secondary enrollment, um, depending on what pathways students participate in. For example, one study found disparities in enrollment in higher education, depending on what pathways students participated in in high school. For example, concentrators in manufacturing, construction, and transportation, who were mostly male, uh, were more likely to attend two-year colleges or go into the workforce directly after high school graduation. Um, and concentrators in engineering, healthcare, and hospitality were just as likely to attend four-year colleges as non-concentrators. And another study also found that students of color and students from low income backgrounds who participated in certain CTE pathways had high, higher earnings compared to their non CTE peers. Um, so clearly there has been a ton of recent research in this area. Next slide. So what kinds of factors um, can drive these inequities? Um, as I mentioned earlier, that multi-state study on participation in CTE pathways found that school level factors such as urbanicity explained almost all of the variation in participation by student demographics such as race and income level. And also related to locale, other research has found that factors such as biases of counselors and other staff, um, school schedules and transportation can also affect access and participation. And some state and local policies can also affect students' access to certain opportunities. For example, work-based learning opportunities are often highly decentralized at state and local levels, which can uh, affect implementation and quality of those programs. Next slide. There is a lot of literature on uh, strategies for improving equity of access and participation in CTE programs. Some of these examples include providing wraparound services to remove barriers for students. So this could include uh, federal funding to support costs of course fees or transportation. Um, another strategy is providing professional development for educators, counselors, and other CTE staff to address biases about who should or shouldn't participate in programs and how to provide supports for students um, who need those supports. Another big one is centering the voices of those who are participating in CTE programs. So asking students what are their experiences and, and how could programs be improved to support their success. And sort of the final example that I've listed here is um, leveraging federal and local data collection to understand gaps in participation and outcomes. And this could look like flagging CTE participation in student information systems and comparing program uh, versus non-program participants. It could also look like uh, just making data more widely available to uh, school and program staff so that they're aware of the equity gaps that might exist in their programs. Next slide. 
And on a final note, um, we wanted to highlight a recently developed resource from the field. Um, so with the proliferation of research on equity and CTE right now, um, the CTE Research Network saw a need for an equity-focused research framework that was specific to CTE. And this framework um, provides researchers with guidance on centering equity in all phases of the research process. So in design, data collection, analysis, reporting, and dissemination. And I believe um, one of my colleagues has put uh, the link to that in the chat. Next slide. So now I will be passing things to my colleague, Jenny, um, who will share more about the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, another federally funded center, and the technical assistance work that they do around CTE. Over to you, Jenny. Thanks, Georgia. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. So again, my name is Jenny Portionaku. I'm a senior education equity specialist with uh, MAEC, the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Uh, I am a former educator myself and have had the pleasure of really helping to lead our work in uh, equity and access to career and tech education. Uh, we are an education uh, equity nonprofit based in the Bethesda, Maryland area, but we work across the country. And really what we do is support educators at the state district uh, and school level in identifying uh, systemic inequities affecting their students and their communities and helping them also to address those inequities through different methods, whether it's data collections, equity audits, professional development. We support in any and every way that it takes for a school district, a school, a state education agency to really operationalize equity. Next slide. Specifically, the work that we've been doing in, uh, in CTE is through our Center for Education Equity. We are the Region 1 Equity Assistance Center funded by the Department of Education. We serve uh, 13 states and two territories from Maine down to Kentucky and including the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Um, we are able to provide our services uh, through our grants so that school uh, schools, school districts, career and tech centers, et cetera, are able to uh, get our services uh, under that grant so they are not having to pull funding from their own sources. Next. A lot of the work we've done in career and tech education has been in the state of Pennsylvania, which began with uh, my wonderful colleague, Kathleen Plasnarski, who you will hear from uh, a bit more at, later on in, in today's session. But we began with a partnership with Eastern Center for Arts and Technology in Willow Grove, uh, Pennsylvania, which was really focused on professional development, use of data, and really doing intentional equity action planning to ensure that students felt a sense of belonging in their career in tech center and that also had access to non-traditional programs and to improve general completion um, of programs by diverse student groups. Uh, from that, we've been able to engage in a partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Education through their CTE Technical Assistance Program, where we are now offering a de uh, equity data inquiry series of workshops for 10 different career and tech centers across the state of Pennsylvania, really focused on understanding the role that data can play in helping to create more equitable access to career and tech education programming. Uh, we've also, thanks to Kathleen in great part, have had the opportunity to participate in a number of Pennsylvania Association of Career and Technical Administrator Conferences, PACTA, where we've been able to provide uh, professional learning sessions uh, for, career, uh, for career and tech administrators and educators. We've also been able to engage in work with counselors for Career and Tech Center who play a really pivotal role in giving or barring access to career and tech education for multiple student groups. Next. The work that we do is really based on the criteria for an equitable school that MAEC developed as part of our equity audit instrument, our tool that's available on our website. That link will be posted later on. We have developed six criteria based on research and our work in the field. Uh, an equitable school is one that has to have a mission around equitable access that's centered on equity, not as an aside, but really centralized. Uh, an equitable school also has to have an inclusive and visual physical environment in career and tech education. A lot of times that can look like thinking about who are we displaying on our walls as engaging in particular career and tech ed fields, uh, thinking about the types of language that we're using and the resources we're putting in front of students and who is represented in those. Uh, an equitable school is also one that has to reflect and work in community in collaboration with different groups. And when we say different groups here, we mean identity groups. So thinking about uh, working across lines of difference along the lines of race, ethnicity, gender, uh, national origin and language and religion. 
uh, and equitable school is also one that works in partnership with families, businesses, community, and civic community organizations. And career tech education naturally lends itself to this kind of partnership the great role that community partners and businesses play in helping to find instructors and providing uh, work-based learning opportunities. Uh, an equitable school is also one that has to have ongoing embedded and systematic uh, and professional learning opportunities. We can't PD our way to equity, but it is really critical that we provide instructors who are engaging with students day in and day out with the resources they need to be able to adequately support them. And finally, this one gets left out a lot, but I really want to shout out Eastern for, for their focus on this, is that the equitable school also has to be one that really caters to students' social emotional well-being and really thinks about how they create a sense of belonging for students that highlights their cultural assets. Um, and so when we think about equity, there can be a lot of abstract conceptions of that, but at MAC, this is really what we boiled it down to, uh, being the most critical elements for a school to have in order to really provide an equitable experience for all students. Next. In working with uh, CTE programs and CTCs, um, and really with any uh, SEA or LEA that we work with, we employ our continuous improvement for equity uh, framework, which really starts by helping uh, the, the clients that we work with, the schools, the districts, understand their system, understand uh, historical roots of inequity, uh, understand patterns that have existed at their schools, um, then also having clear aims and a real clear strategy for how they're going to address inequities. And really, this uh, one of the key tools we use in this process is data, and we leverage it in different ways. So, for example, we could be looking at different sources of data. A lot of times there's a focus on Perkins 5 data, enrollment, uh, NOPTI or other certification data. But there's also qualitative data that needs to be considered, like culture and climate surveys and other uh, and, uh, town halls, focus groups, whatever you need to do to really engage those who are most proximate to, to inequity, which in this case would be our students and our staff. And so this approach of continuous improvement for equity ensures that uh, we're being intentional in really identifying and addressing the root causes of inequity, not just symptoms of those inequities that can then creep up again later on. Next. Whenever we're working with a career and tech center or CTE program, we really do a lot of work in understanding where they are in their equity journey. And so in some contexts, we might start at the center uh, trying to address beliefs and potential biases of staff and administrators that can really impact student experience. So for example, in our work with counselors and where they send particular students, what programs they gear them towards in CTE, which students are, are offered access to CTE versus not. Um, we might begin there if that's where we need to begin. There are some cases where beliefs and biases isn't the place where we can start, but we can start with systems and structures like data that can then shift school culture and practices. Um, and so it's really important to note that beliefs can Im uh, impact our behaviors, which can create a certain culture in our schools, which then contributes to certain systems and structures. But the opposite is also true. The ways in which we leverage policies, data, et cetera, can lead to a certain set of norms or culture in a school that then impact interpersonal behaviors, and then those lead to specific individual beliefs. Where exactly a career and tech center or program is, and then try to uh, create a customized plan for them to advance uh, through, the, through these different uh, elements of creating a positive school culture for students. Next. So I wanted to provide an example of the ways in which we leverage data to help uh, career and tech centers really and programs understand uh, how bias, how inequity might show up. So for example, here we have enrollment data in uh, CT enrollment in Pennsylvania specifically. And we've shown this slide and this, um, this type of data to different practitioners, whether administrators at Jenny, we appear to have lost your audio. Georgia or Catherine, I'm going to have you step in um, until we get Jenny back on audio. All right. Um, so I think as as Jenny is share, sharing here, um, this is sort of the CTE enrollment data that they look at. Um, by their demographic categories. Um, and yeah, Catherine, um, if you could jump in, that would be wonderful if you have uh, some thoughts on this piece. Sure, I just wanted, I'm sure that um, 
th that Jenny will elaborate on this more, but I think we've really found that it's very powerful to look at your um, data um, and to drill into it as much as you can in detail. One thing that we've sometimes seen is that you know, at the top level, you may see that there's there could be equity and who's getting in the door to a CTE program or pathway. But if you drill down to like who's getting access to some of those higher value um, opportunities like an internship, um, you may see inequities there if you're able to look at data on that or even just get anecdotal information about it. Um, so we found that working with districts to look at those kinds of um, kind of what, what experiences are students actually happening having once they get into the program is uh, is quite helpful. All right, um, apologies, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Great, sorry, Zoom crashed, of course. <laughs> of course, no Thank problem, for, Jenny. for taking over, Catherine. But yes, as you were saying, we have folks uh, think about what connections they're making, what are they seeing, and then to use this as a jumping off point to consider how they can use, look at their own data. So in this example here, we would want folks to start thinking about what they're noticing, for example, around race and ethnicity, when clearly there is a disproportionate enrollment in CTE compared to the overall school enrollment in grades 9 through 12 in Pennsylvania. And we notice this when we drill down even further into programmatic data that we start to see differences in, uh, in gender uh, uh, for certain programs, uh, which aligns with the research that Georgia raised earlier. Next slide. So similarly to what was shown before, some of the uh, the inequities we've noticed and where often implicit bias can come into place is, for example, as I just mentioned, enrollment of specific student populations in CTE overall, but then on top of that, disproportionate enrollment of different student groups within specific CTE programs, whether it's in business and technology programs, health ally, uh, allied health fields, um, the trades uh, and, uh, and, and, and things of that nature, we see lots of disparities there in who is enrolled in those programs. Uh, as mentioned earlier, disparities in access to specific tools or resources that um, can create uh, in, unintentionally often a barrier to participate in specific programs if you need particular tools for welding, manufacturing, et cetera. There's also what we've noticed disparities in access to apprenticeships, internships, and work-based learning opportunities. Even in career and tech ed programs where there is proportionate enrollment overall, there might be less uh, proportionality when it comes to uh, the ability to access these other career, uh, th these college and career pathways that are so critical. And then finally, a big one that we've seen is also having policies or structures that inadvertently create barriers to access for students with IEPs or 504s and also language requirements that might in, uh, inhibit students who are classified as English learners or multilingual learners from enrolling or being successful in their programs. Next. So this is not a linear pathway. Moving towards equity and access to CTE is not linear. It is very iterative. So you'll never fully be done, but it's really important to continue to think about how do you uh, engage in equity work that's responsive to your school and community context. Um, and so here is an example that of, of what a potential entry point into the work could look like. Maybe it's that you initially form a career a committee or work group um, it, to engage in school-wide work, and maybe you begin by defining what does equity mean for our per particular CTE program. Uh, you could conduct an equity audit of your school and classroom practices to really find out because you uh, what the needs are, because sometimes we don't know what we don't know about student experience collecting and diversifying the forms of data that we use on a regular basis, then shifting into actually continually disaggregating and analyzing data. Often we look at data at summative points at the end of the year to plan for the following year, but that continuous looking at data and disaggregation is really critical for continuing to make sure that we're addressing student needs. Um, continuing to have that capacity building and development for staff, especially to ensure that they feel supported in having conversations with students and supporting students of diverse backgrounds. And finally, also creating networks of support. It's so great to see so many of you here that hopefully can touch base and have networks of support um, across CTE programs in different states to really learn from one another and to support each other in this work. Um, this is not the exact pathway that Eastern took, for example, but it is one way that you could approach. And at MAC, we're happy to help identify what those entry points are. So to close out my section, next slide. I'd like to offer you two tools, and those links are in the chat now. We have our equity audit tool, which is available free for download on our website, um, and our data inquiry tool. These are both that we've used with different career and tech centers and programs to help them uncover 
areas of need related to equity and also to think about how they can leverage data to address those. Um, and so with that, I will pass it back to Georgia. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so now we'll shift to our panel discussion where, where we will hear um, some on the ground perspectives from our practitioner panelists on how they're thinking about equity in their work. Um, so I think we can pull the slides down and go to gallery mode here. Wonderful. So Kathleen, let's start with you. Um, could you introduce yourself? Um, tell us a bit about your work and how you're thinking of equity when it comes to who has access to and who's participating in programs at Eastern and sort of what data you rely on to inform that. Hey, and those are big questions right there, right? Um, so my, my name is Kathleen Plesnarski. I'm the executive director of Eastern Center for Arts and Technology, which is a public career and technical school serving nine districts in suburban Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia. And um, it's a wonderful place to be. When I think about equity, I think about access, but I also think about experiences, opportunities, and student outcomes, and making sure that all of our students are, 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 are having those in an equitable fashion. We have been so fortunate to work with Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Three years ago, when we started our equity work, You know, one of the things that really came from that, um, that sort of made us made us think about that is we we had some of our districts um, coming in, coming forward and saying, hey, you know, our our school isn't serving special needs students with special needs. And for me, being a relatively new director, I was like a little bit offended because 38% of our 38 to 40% of our students on an, any given year um, have special needs. And so when we sat down with our district personnel to really like hash out what was really happening, um, what, what came out of it is that we've had this lifelong motto at our school from the 80s of getting the right student in the right program for the right reason which has a feel to it that could be very positive, but also has a sort of an insidious feel to it where you're really you know, making sure the right kids get in and who can determine right kids. So when we had those discussions, we also identified um, some inequities in our registration process. An unwritten rule was that they expected students to be able to pass the NOCTI to, to get admittance to our school. That's our end of program assessment. And then the other thing um, that we noticed when we looked at our actual written procedure was that a student who was a junior, because we only serve juniors and seniors, was given priority over a student coming in as a senior, and that inadvertently um, discriminated against students with special needs who may have been planning to attend for two or somewhat three more years. So we we got rid of the right kid in the right program for the right reason. Um, we made some changes to our procedure to remove that language that could be discriminatory. And we have a pretty clear process for, for how we support student enrollment in our, our building uh, for all of our students and ensuring career scopes are taken, ensuring that you know we, we are attending IEP meetings. And then we have modified curriculum as most schools do in Pennsylvania, where if you're going into automotive technology, um, you could choose a career objective to be an automotive technician, or you could choose to be an under car care specialist. And the first task, the first career objective requires you to complete the entire program. And the second career objective still allows you to gain employment, but by completing less of that to be able to modify depending on student needs. But just going back to Jenny and not try not to take up um, too much time. The other thing that we really experienced um, through Jenny, through our work with Jenny is finally implementing a climate culture survey with students. And we did it during the pandemic and everyone else said, please, <laughs> please do not um, do this during the pandemic. Nobody's happy right now. We're not happy, teachers aren't happy. And so Jenny helped us put together a climate culture survey. And, and the first year we did it, our eyes were open and it made us realize that you know, some of our students who, who were transgender and gender expansive might not be having positive experiences at our school. We also realized that why, while administrators felt like they were supporting teachers and teachers felt like they were supporting students, um, students didn't feel like they were being supported and cared about and teachers didn't feel like they were being supported and cared about. So I'm, I'm happy to say that we, we implemented professional development for our staff for understanding and supporting students who are trans, transgender and gender expansive. We, uh, we changed our policy and procedure um, so that our teachers could support our students who are transgender and gen gender expansive in the classroom. And like, just to give you an example, it's just making sure that the, the student that we, we have known as Steve for the whole two years that he has been in our program gets a certificate of completion from us 
that gives his legal name so he can he can use it and matches up to his license, but also uses his preferred name so that we're honoring him and where he is. And so it's just it's just clearing all that up, what bathrooms bathroom students use and what what pronouns we use and 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 being able to make sure that our teachers aren't dead naming students on, on day one that we're actually like getting to know our students and getting their preferred names and pronouns before we even call attendance for day one. And then having a form for students to, to report to us if they're changing their preferred names and pronouns. And then we also talk about like, you know, who can we share that with? And then we we have someone who's designated to meet with and support with the, support those students. So we've kind of um, done a lot and I don't wanna go off on a ramble because I know I've exceeded my three minutes. So I'm sure Lori's got more to say. That's okay, Kathleen. I really appreciate the specific examples that you've given. So, Lori, I will pass it over to you. Would love to hear about you, your work, and and um, how you're thinking about equity and um, some of the data that you're looking at to support that. So, Lori Ferguson, director of the Career Center at Coventry High School. I've been the director here for 14 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of changes, both on the state level and local level in our school. Um, I think that we've grown exponentially in the past 14 years, um, primarily around belief in who should access CTE, what is CTE, and um, you know how is it new and different than the beliefs that people had from this, the vocational education. So I came in pretty naive when I started, um, thinking that everyone thought like me and that we should be out there training everybody to do whatever it was that they wanted to do when they graduated from high school. And I, I realized that there were so many inequities at the beginning, just because of the mindsets, the biases that that our own people had, our own staff had, not, um, not maliciously, but it, it was just inherent. And so I had a, like a big undertaking in just trying to change the mindset of the way we all thought about who should access CTE, um, what did it really look like. And 14 years later, I'm still doing that, but we have gotten so far in our thinking, um, you know, we went from 327 students enrolled in CTE and we're a big comprehensive high school. We used to have a little under 2000 students. We now have a little under 1300 students just by, um, you know, the way the community is, um, you know, uh, expanding or not expanding. So, in 14 years ago, we had just under 1,900 students, and we only had 300 students, a little over 300 students in, in seven CTE programs. So now we have just about 900 students. Um, over 60% of our po population is taking advantage of the opportunities that we have in CTE. And so how did we do that and change that mindset? was um, really opening up more, more challenging and rigorous opportunities for students. So we wanted to change the way parents thought about the old vocational education. We wanted them to think about it as a new form of education. And if your child has to come to school and take all of the graduation requirements, no matter what, who you are, no matter what path you want to go down, why not take advantage of adding a career and technical um, component to your education? So you're, you're getting high school ready, you're getting prepared for college or whatever you want to do after, but now you're studying something that you are passionate about or that you didn't know you were passionate about or exploring something that you would do after high school. So Lots of mind shifts, lots of um, talking to guidance counselors about, you know, the um, the um, financial benefit to students if they're getting certified as a cosmetologist or licensed, you know, after four years of high school and saving twenty to thirty thousand on 
um, a post-secondary uh, training, you know, that's huge for a student who really needs to be working, who loves cosmetology, who loves hair and makeup, and is go, go, we're setting that person up for success after high school. So um, I also, just to um, talk a little bit about student voice, I found that um, in the first year of the program or after the first year of students enrolling in programs, there was a lot of, um, of, of exit, right? So they would go into a program in ninth grade and then all of a sudden they were out of it with really nothing, um, no idea of where they wanted to go next. So really looking at that, we decided to cut our uh, ninth grade programs into semester programs so that students could take more than one and explore a couple of fields while they were in ninth grade and then um, decide on um, you know, their main program for 10th grade. So this didn't take away a lot of time from their program and it allowed them to do some exploration and then really fine tune. I think that um, really emphasized our attrition rates uh, by doing that. So students stayed in a program rather than move around or to drop out later. We also implemented senior surveys so that when seniors left, we could get feedback from them on their um, experience and then use that to improve any areas that you know were necessary, whether it was in the experience that they had, lack of opportunity or you know they wish they had done something more that they you know maybe didn't get to so um that's the way that i think we addressed some of the inequities that we've had over the years um i can also um build on what kathleen said Kath kathleen said about um gender inequities and of course of course in the trades areas we have um, high male representation and low female representation so same kinds of things in programs as far as the kinds of um, student population entering those programs Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Um, Jenny, I want to give a, a chance for you to share. Um, you know, you mentioned um, how you've worked with Eastern to develop some surveys to under uncover root causes of disparities in program enrollment. Um, and Lori just mentioned her process for doing surveys as well. Um, I'm curious about how you know, you've uh, worked with Kathleen and her team um, to really look at that data and um, make decisions around what you're seeing with that. Sure, and I'll speak briefly and then let, let Kathleen talk more about it because she's really been a, a, a huge champion of this work at her school. Uh, but when we started working, one of the things that we talked about was uh, noticing which programs had students that often left before completing their program and not uh, fully completing the program and receiving their certifications in that program. And so what the team, one of the th things the team took on was thinking about what possible root causes could have been and landed on a couple of ways that they could try to address those. One of which was uh, a, an exit survey that they developed for any student who did not continue on in the program from their junior to senior year to understand more about the reasons that led them to leaving the program and to get a sense for whether or not that was tied to a, uh, the lack of sense of belonging or lack of feeling supported, and then disaggregating that based on their demographic data as well to help pinpoint where there might be some patterns. Um, because anecdotally, staff could share patterns about who they were thinking was leaving programs often, but now they would actually have a story to tell with their data to then have conversations with staff around why particular student groups might be leaving or not feel as supported despite what teacher perceptions might have been. Um, with that, I'll pass it to Kathleen to share more about how they've engaged, but but MAC was really able to support you know work that they were already thinking about, and then to offer them a process to really uncover that data um, further and disaggregate it and think about patterns that they might be noticing. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Just to just to add to that, and just sort of to step back for a moment, 
Um, Eastern Center for Arts and Technology has always maintained what we call key indicator data. So we could go back for like, I don't know, probably 20 years if anyone's interested in that in terms of research, but we can go back and identify, you know, what was our enrollment in our school? Um, what was our attendance rate? Um, what was our um, retention rate? Uh, kids who start in their junior year and then finish after their senior year. Um, our completion rate, completing a program and achieving a career objective. Our NOCTI scores, our industry certification attainment, uh, have, uh, having attained at least one of our industry certifications per program, as all of our programs offer a minimum of one. And then the last metric that we have is um, post-program placement, where we survey students a year after high school to see what they're doing. So we have all that data. And historically, we've always looked at it to see how we're doing from one year to the next and to sort of set goals. And it was really Jenny who, who came in to say, okay, so we've got the climate and culture survey, and then we have this key indicator data. So let's, let's examine both of those for disproportionality. So part of our equity action plan was really defining our demographics in terms of you know, how we were going to disaggregate that data. So we had race and ethnicity. Um, we also disaggregated by gender. We disaggregated by economic status. We disaggregated by whether or not uh, students um, had, were, had special needs. And I don't know if I'm missing something, but of course, after this is done, I'll remember something I'm missing. But we have that disaggregated. And I think like one of the essential questions is, you know, how do you define disproportionality? Like I'm very passionate about data. Like I'm the, that nerd that chose, chose to do a quantitative study for my dissertation. So I'm, I'm into it. So initially we were kind of going with like a plus or minus 3%. But when you have a smaller group that you're looking at, especially as you're disaggregating by program and race, ethnicity, then you start to get those smaller, smaller numbers. And that can be that can have a larger impact on on variance. So we ended up going with a compilation score. But when we initially looked at the data and going back to what Jenny said, what we noticed in, in disproportionality was there was a disproportionality in our retention rates among our student demographics. And what we realized is we have no idea why kids leave our programs. And some of the essential questions were, you know, well, what kind of perceptions are students taking with them about our programs? Um, did they feel a sense of belonging and welcome um, from our teacher? Did they feel a sense of belonging and welcome um, and camaraderie with their classmates? And then, you know, obviously career and technical education is a choice. So we really have to think about like, was the program marketed and did it meet their expectations? Because if they're going into a culinary program because we're marketing a certain way and they're experiencing something else, we need to shift in our marketing so that kids come in with a more realistic picture of what it's going to look like. And I'm just, I just, there's two good news bear stories I want to share with you. And, and one is we, we sampled out our pilot exit survey to really understand the perceptions that kids had. Last year was the second year of the climate culture survey. The first year during the pandemic, it was terrible. And then, and then the next year, the average positive response rate for each of our questions was a 96.8. So it was extremely high. Um, so, so the other good news is when we start looking at that data for our, our pilot of the kids who, who left and did not, not retain our programs, what we're really finding out is it's, it's like 95% of them, it really is just a, a shift in career. Like they experienced it and realized it was something they didn't want to do with their, their life. So we're trying to sort of examine that as an equity group to understand like what, what should it be and what should we be aiming for and what's acceptable and not acceptable and what can we do about it? Thank, Thank you. you, Kathleen. Um, I think we are coming up on our Q&A time, um, but Lori, I'll just uh, give you a, a minute for any final thoughts to, to build on what Kathleen had shared. Yeah, I think Kathleen, you hit it right on the head when you said um, that it's what, what do students know about a program when they're coming in? And I think that's where the middle school, we really have to do um, your, your, your programs start in 11th grade, ours start in 9th grade, so we're doing a lot of work in the middle school, and we've started that since the pandemic, um, just because it was easy to, uh, to get students here because they were on distance learning at that time, and we could do it in small groups because we were not open, but in that, in the past three or four years, we've really um, strengthened our middle school program so that we have them coming here often to try different programs and to get in for 20, 25 minutes and experience 
a program in a hands-on way. So, you know, we'll take a team of kids here. We just had two teams here yesterday. They, um, they pick three programs um, on a Google form. We schedule them in three programs and they go through, they rotate through 20 minutes each. So now, you know, something that they had been thinking about was really great and uh, like game design, everybody wants to go to game design because they think they're going to go there and just play video games, but they don't realize they're learning coding and programming and, you know, they get in there and they're like, oh, wow, okay, this is what it's about. So now they look at, well, what do I really like? Right. So now they can look at some other programs and, and find out if there is something better suited for them. So I think strengthening our middle school programs, even starting in the fifth grade, we have students coming up in the fifth grade and they do a we do a career fair here. We have them go through all of our programs, just like um, like a college fair, only it's uh, students and they set up tables. And they talk to kids about what these programs are. So now, hopefully, by the time they get here, they are actually picking programs that are more suited to them and not something they just thought they liked. And, um, you know, uh, hopefully that will that will help in that completion rate. Thank you, Lori. Um, mm -hmm. So now I'd like to move us to our Q&A portion. Um, and so I'm going to pass things to Catherine, who is going to facilitate that. Thanks, Georgia. So before we go to the questions that are coming in through the chat, I'd like us to start with a question that several of you raised when you registered, which is what are strategies that can help ensure that students with disabilities are getting access to your CTE programs? Um, and I know we started in to talk a little bit about this um, during the panel, but I was hoping that uh, Kathleen, you could say a little bit more about particular strategies you've been using. Yeah, so I think we always have to remember that, um, you know, we're here to serve all, all students and serve our community. And, you know, Eastern, as I said earlier, is 38 to 40 percent uh, students with special needs on any any given year. Um, and our enrollment process is, is pretty strategic. Um, you know, it starts in middle school where we actually do a, a virtual presentation. And then when students are in 10th grade and they're thinking about coming to our school, um, we do what we call Career Expo. And, and we have staff and students from that school who go out and they go into the auditorium of that school. We show a video about our school and then the students talk about the program and their experience in the program. So they get an overview of Eastern. And then uh, about six weeks later, they actually pick three programs, come over and have a tour, where they actually get to spend time in the program. And then we follow that up with an open house. Um, the other thing I think that's very unique that Eastern does, this so the open house allows students to come in with parents, but we also use our Perkins funding to pay for every student who wants to enter into our programs to take a career scope so that they can align what their career interests are with our programs and it's very helpful for, for all of our students to make sure that, you know, like if, if you on your career scope would really prefer to work in an office, you, you probably don't wanna go into construction, right? So um, that's, that's some of the stuff that we do. And then when, when we have students with special needs, which is, which is almost half of our population, we make sure that um, we are part of the IEP process. So the student would take the career scope like everyone else does they would reconvene an IEP meeting, our staff would attend, and we would talk about the program choice and what the expectations are in that program, review the IEP to make sure that the specifically designed instruction within the IEP are things that we, we, we can accommodate. And if there's additional like sort of switches we need to make, we can do that. Um, and that IEP is also the, the placeholder for the accommodations that students would receive on the NACTI and the program assessment. So we do a lot of stuff to make sure that students are set up with success um, to begin with. And then when they join our programs, that's when they start to explore career objectives. But we also try to inform our, um, our, our special ed teachers and our counselors about our career objectives. So if, if, if curriculum needs to be modified, we can do that at the IEP meeting too in terms of, of goals for students. Um, and so, and I think I said earlier, you know, the example of the undercar care specialist for automotive compared to an automotive technician sort of helps to modify um, curriculum for, for students while still giving them a career goal that's, that's, that's viable. And I, I think I just want to give some metrics. Like we found 
uh, based on our data, that students with special needs have a higher retention rate, that once they're in a program, they, they typically stay within that program and finish. They have better attendance. Um, they have comparable placement after high school, and we call positive placement um, going on to post-secondary, working in a, a, a career that, a, a job that's related to the trade we train them for, or entering into the military, although our students with special needs have a higher propensity to go directly into the workforce than, than post-secondary, so that's something to look at. And we also have comparable industry certification attainment amongst our, our students with special needs and our students who do not have special needs. So, and then, I, you know, someone had asked, I think part of that question was, you know, what about um, students that have um, behavioral challenges and, and, and have an IEP? And, you know, what we, we find is, um, I've been in career and technical education 24 years, and one of the things I love about it is our school is a game changer for many kids who maybe don't know how to play school and maybe are not as successful with a, a very rigid classroom environment. Um, and I think, you know, we find a lot of students who may have challenges at their own schools come here and their behavior is a little bit different. We're, we're very hands-on. That lends itself to a little bit of, 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 of freedom. Um, and then we also have provided our staff with, with extensive training now on trauma-informed instruction. And Jenny started that with us. And then and we, we also moved on to continue that work because we knew how important it was. And just to make sure that our, our teachers are creating a, a positive classroom environment and that they're, they have tools to, to create a great environment for kids to begin with and to deescalate when things, things get heated. Great, thank you. And Lori, how about you in Rhode Island? What strategies are you using uh, to open access for students with special needs? Well, we want to make sure that their career goals that are in their IEP align with our program. So, uh, and not just, um, and they're not just being placed in a program because that's where the teacher thinks they should be or because they have, um, because they like it. So we really are looking at what are their career goals and is it realistic for them to achieve those career goals? And once we've determined that, then we design the program around those goals. So their, their program may look very different than um, a student without an IEP or even another student with an IEP. It really depends on uh, what kind of work they're looking for, how long it's going to take them. Um, sometimes students stay in a program much longer so that they can really work towards that certificate having until age 23 um, before they, they are done. So we look at those um, parameters and then uh, to help all students, whether with an IEP or without, we do have an embedded literacy teacher that comes into all of our programs and helps students with reading and writing, especially with text and um, you know, getting ready for certifications or licensing exams. So I think the main thing is to really identify what the career goals are and to make sure that the program can meet those goals. And as far as behavior uh, challenges, you know, um, students learn best when they're doing something they're interested in. So while a student might have a behavior issue outside of a CTE program, they very rarely have one in that program. Uh, so we don't deny anybody, but we do, we do um, set parameters around expectations and what the behavior is for a student within a program. They are working with equipment and uh, there are a lot of safety concerns. As long as a student can demonstrate that they can be safe to themselves and others in a program, then uh, that's who we want. We want we want kids who are interested in being trained and having something that they can do when they leave high school. That's great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to raise up a question that came through in the chat um, about what kind of professional development are you providing um, to your staff? And maybe Kathleen, you could start us off. Yeah, I mean, Jenny, Jenny's first year with us um, was extensive professional development. I think our staff ended up getting about 14 hours of professional development. And then Jenny helped me put together a professional development module um, for new teachers and new staff members 
Um, and it's really like, I'm actually kind of proud of it. Like it starts out with people defining equity and it, it's just for us to make sure that when we hire people and they come in and they've missed all the training that we've had with Jenny around equity and, and bias and understanding implicit bias and its impact on the classroom, Jenny helped me curate. It's about seven different short videos and so the people going through this module as they, they gain employment here, and they answer the question, what does equity mean to them? They watch the videos. The videos are non-threatening. It's really talking about like there's a phenomena of, of implicit bias. And this is what the impact is on, you know, students getting recommendation letters. Um, this is the impact of the classroom. Here's some strategies that you can use in a classroom to pr promote equity. And then it ends with a video on psychosocialization. All but one video is under four minutes each video. And it really just helps to introduce um, our, our new employees into the concept of, you know, sort of being mindful. And then, you know, we're still working as an equity committee because right now the, the the two new staff members who finished like had to come to me and talk about it. <laughs> and I'm the director. So we we are as an equity committee. We just we just pick someone else that would be um, probably better for it. But I do really appreciate Jenny's help in doing that. And I've gotten really good reviews from people who have who have completed it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, well, I'm gonna turn it back to Georgia, but I'll just say thank you for the other questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them, but uh, if you registered for this webinar, um, we will um, potentially be creating a Q&A document that we'll send out to folks when we send out the slides and so on later this month. So thank you very much and I'll turn it back to Georgia. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so just a couple of things to close us down today. Um, before um, you leave, we ask that you please uh, share your feedback in a short survey. We've put the link in the chat. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this um, as it really helps us improve our um, future webinars and support to um, folks like you. And um, that survey will also automatically launch when you uh, leave the webinar. And finally, we've included our contact information on this slide if you'd like to reach out with questions. Um, and we really appreciate you all joining us today. Um, the webinar recording will be archived and uploaded to IES's YouTube channel. And if you've registered for today's webinar, you'll see receive an email from us with a link to the recording when it is ready. Um, thank you again and have a great rest of your day.